Good afternoon. I'm um, very pleased to be here for this brief look at uh, one of our projects at Taffer Music. Um, so just briefly, I'll introduce Taffer Music. We are a period instrument orchestra, which means we play on instruments and in styles appropriate to the era of the music. We concentrate on Baroque and classical music, so Bach and Handel through to Beethoven. There are 17 members of the orchestra, plus music director Elisa Citerio. We have an extensive season in Toronto of 50 concerts, as well as up to 30 smaller non-subscription events. And we tour around the world. In fact, we are Canada's most toured orchestra. And in recent years, we've been in China, Korea, the US, and next month, we're off to Australia. And of course, we do a tour across Canada as well. Uh, we've recorded over 80 albums, and we have our own recording label. We have healthy audiences in terms of numbers and 70% of our tickets are sold on subscription, but we do have a problem in common with much of the classical world. And that is our audience is not getting any younger. <laughs> I should say that I am in no way ageist, and I want people of all age ages to enjoy our music, but an audience which is by and large over 65 is an issue. Time and time again, I speak to donors who say they have started following the orchestra back in the 1980s and remark that they are sat next to the same people today now, just older. They have not been replenished. Of course, the worry is that our audience will die out, but the effects have felt more widely than that. Our donor base is even older than our audience base, something like 70% over the age of 70. And of course, it also affects board recruitment. Now, some in the classical world would dismiss this as, as an issue, saying that the audience will rejuvenate naturally. But personally, I don't think there's some magic that happens when someone hits 65 that helps them to suddenly love classical music. Additionally, National Endowment for the Arts Statistics in the US show that the age group now most likely to attend has moved from 45 to 64 to 65 to 74 in the last decade. At the same time, audiences in the States have decreased by 24%. So we have an, an, an older and an aging audience. But if you want a different audience and a young audience, we have to understand them. Last year, an article in the Chicago Tribune was widely shared. It proposed that we are in the midst of an arts revolution. So what is that revolution about? This, the exuberant expression of self. And that is not necessarily good news for a sector which by and large expects its audiences to do this. <laughs> which is largely to sit down, behave and be quiet. Today, half of 18 to 20, 22 year olds have made their own music. Half of them say they have taught themselves something. Many have spent more hours playing video games than it takes to master the violin. And consider this. If you had asked random Americans in 1950 if they had thought themselves important, about 12% would have said yes. By the 1990s, that number had risen to 85%. Now, young people just don't want to talk about our culture, they want to be engaged in it, in the storytelling and also the process of judgment. The traditional gatekeepers are not relevant to them. So we're seeing a fundamental shift in how people behave and how they expect to engage and create. Even if we do lazily assume that people will start to like classical music as they get older, this potential replenishment audience are going to be radically different in their outlook to those in our audiences now. Some art forms have really understood this. Look at the rise of festivals, now which provide as much a social experience as a musical one, and which allow participants to curate their own musical experience. They also touch those important audience needs we, we saw yesterday. They're social, they're lively, and they're interactive. Of course, a third factor is at play, the large-scale decline in music education. So again, we can't take it for granted that people will have any exposure to classical music at all. So we could be facing a bit of a ticking time bomb for classical music with our performances very much based on we play and you listen. What happens when our current audience is no longer with us and we expect an, a new audience to engage with us on the old terms? Studies with newcomers have shown they often feel very disconnected from classical performances, particularly due to the lack of engagement between audience and performer at most concerts. One thing I believe we need to do is to reinstate the lost link between performers and audience to break down the fourth wall. In my previous role with the London-based Orchestra of the Age of Enlightenment, I started the late night night shift series, taking the core repertoire of classical music out of the concert hall and putting it into new settings which are relevant for the audience. Now, this picture here is from a performance at Ducky, a queer club night in South London. There, the orchestra received one of the warmest receptions I'd ever seen in some pretty unlikely surroundings. The night shift was about getting new, younger audiences for the orchestra, but it was also, at least in part, about finding new ways for the audience and orchestra to interact. As the orchestra's concertmaster put it, this is about empowerment. 
audiences want to have a bit more ownership of what they're listening to. The best performances involve a three-way relationship. The music, i.e. what's on the page, the audience, and the performers. The performers react not only to the written notes, but to each other, and most importantly, to the audience. But all too often in today's concerts, the third part of that equation is forgotten. Often when we're, when, we're, when we're performing, you can't even see beyond the first couple of rows, let alone to the back of a thousand seat concert hall. So this brings me to Tafel Music's Courageous Act, a project called House Music. I joined Tafel Music in October 2015, and when I started, I was asked, when can we do a night shift? The organization was already doing a great series called Baroque and Beer with informal performances in Toronto bars. There was a problem, however. While targeted at under 35s, it was largely attracting our existing audience. This wasn't the point of doing these events. <laughs> and it also meant we couldn't change the experience in the way we wanted. Not only that, but our existing audience brought with them accepted codes of behavior at a concert, which we wanted to get away from. So we needed something more tailored to the needs of an under 35 audience, and it needed to be, to be marketed in a different way, so house music was developed. When we did this, we were not trying to be all things for all people. This was explicitly not for our regular audience, and to be honest, we didn't want them to come. <laughs> it's also not about getting audiences in on soft stuff before moving on to something a bit harder. I don't see this as a vehicle for us getting younger audiences to eventually come to a proper concert. It is about understanding this audience is different and is something different from our existing audience. It doesn't really matter pe how people experience our music as long as they do. I wanted to evolve uh, the idea from the Night Shift project, which was more gig-like. So we decided we wanted to make a new concert experience, one that was more immersive and one which would unfold both in front of but also around the audience. We wanted it to be intimate. Importantly, it is absolutely not about changing the music. And we believe uh, that our core repertoire has broad appeal if performed in the right way for the right audience. In order to accomplish this, we decided to collaborate with stage directors from Toronto's thriving indie opera scene. Their brief was to think afresh about how a concert could be staged with movement, other artists, dance, and lighting. Alongside, and along, alongside this, I knew from experience that we had to think differently about how we marketed and sold the series. We developed a totally separate brand for the series with separate social media from Tafel Music. This allows us to develop a brand targeted at the demographic and to use language and tone we wouldn't usually use from something branded as Tafel Music. We also wanted to look at what some of the barriers to attendance might be. There's no magic bullet, but a low price point, a shorter experience, a venue known to the audience, and a roster of performers which was wider than just the orchestra were all important as was gathering lots of images of the audience so that people could see that people like them go to this kind of event. It was important that it was a social experience as well as a musical one, a night out, not just a concert. To that end, it was also really important for us to think about the audience experience and the look and feel of the event right from the moment someone steps through the door. Our first event was a pilot and was back in May 2016. We had an ensemble of four musicians and director Amanda Smith set up various stages around the venue with musicians moving between each. We worked with an, with an electronic artist who provided linking tracks to cover those movements and who also provided pre and post concert DJ sets. The event was all standing, bar a few bean bags, and we had a bar open throughout. Since then, we've put on a further five events, working with four different directors and each featuring different music and chamber ensembles from the orchestra, as well as sound artists, dancers, video artists, and actors. So the big question is, is it working? And the answer is yes, to an extent. For one thing, we can see visibly that the audience is different. Um, we gather statistical and qualitative feedback after every performance, and the audience comments are proving very useful and largely very positive. It's definitely not the audience that comes to our normal shows. Um, and despite the fact that audiences are smaller than our subscription season, we often get as much social media interaction from an audience of 200 at house music than we do over four nights at a normal concert. We know that, that on average, the audience is 67% under 35, hugely different from our regular audience. 100% say they've returned, but although getting them to do so is a work in progress. Around 15 to 20 percent at each show have never been to a classical concert before, and around 35 percent have never seen or heard of tap music before. So what could we do better? Well, we'd like audiences to be bigger. Our maximum audience so far has been around 200, and we see wide fluctuations between events, so we'd like it to be building more. 
We can also do a better job of selling the project and its results across the organization, both within the orchestra and the staff. Um, it is hard sometimes to put the perspective of a non-attender to people for whom classical music is their world and life. With this, with this project, it's really important to understand that we, the management and the artists, are not the audience. And I have to say that the idea that this is not building audiences for our main stage concerts is, is controversial. But it's my firm belief that we need to get away from seeing a two-hour concert at 8 p.m. as the only way to experience classical music. And that if we want to survive as an art form, we have to start developing different products for different people. That's not to say that new audiences won't come to tradi traditional shows. Some will. But if we, if we truly want to broaden our appeal, we have to offer uh, our music to new people in new ways. Um, other learnings are that we have become rather too director-led. Our young directors have been super enthusiastic, and perhaps overly so. But we feel we've got too far away from the simple idea of a, new, of a new way to stage a concert, and often found directors imposing too much of a narrative. And that's something for us to think about. It's also been interesting, interesting to think about embracing failure. The classical music is often all about perfection, so this is a hard one. But I think it's good for us to have a laboratory where we can experiment both with artists and with concepts. But we have to accept that that means sometimes it's not perfect and we have things to learn from. Lastly, I don't think this is enough. We're committing around 0.7% of our budget to this project. If we're serious about generating new audiences and building organizational resilience, we have to do far, far more. So what's next? We're looking at changing our communications mix. Um, building in more lead time to the events and more consistency to them. One of the successes of my previous project was that with time it didn't matter what we played. Audiences trusted us to deliver a good night out and we have to achieve that with house music. We're looking at keeping to a consistent director and sticking to the aims of having a director, reimagining the concert experience and not developing a narrative. We're realizing that our repertoire needs to be more tailored to this audience and we want to find new ways to increase interactivity. We also want to involve the audience more in how the series evolves and form an audience panel. And we also want to expand the series, initially to four events a year and then to events that involve the full orchestra. We're really looking forward to experimenting further over the years, and I'll be very happy to share more and talk about this project if anyone's interested. Thank you very much.